Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. I am very excited about today's show. This is the show for those of you who are here for the first time in which I celebrate artists and their body of worth. What makes a great artist? What do they bring to the table? I've got two great artists joining us today. But in addition to celebrating these great artists, I'm also going to be celebrating an institution, the Rehearsal Club. Now, my main um, connection, I guess, uh, with the rehearsal club is the movie Stage Door. Although it was called the Footlights Club, it was based very much on the rehearsal club. It was a place for young women to come in New York. It opened in 1913. And I have two very special ladies here who are keeping this legacy alive. First of all, direct from Mrs. Maisel. We have her right here today, Cynthia Darlow and Gail Patron. And I thank you both for being here today. Uh, we're going to celebrate each other and we're going to celebrate this great institution. Uh, but before we begin, as I begin with all of our shows, uh, today marks 314 days since our theaters shut down in New York. Wow. And I want to take a moment to pause and think about all the artists that are currently out of work. Those who are lucky enough, like Cynthia, to be, she's gone back to work and we're all better for that because Mrs. Maisel keeps us entertained. Uh, but I want to ask you both before we start, and I want to start with you, Cynthia. Um, how are you doing really in the midst of this crazy world we find ourselves in right now? Well, I, I have to say that um, what's happened with the rehearsal club since the pandemic began is a bit of a silver lining uh, because we were all confined to quarantining and everything is virtual anyway. Uh, we got a lot of work done this year in uh, in every area from surprisingly, shockingly to me, from fundraising on through planning every single thing that we're going to do moving forward. Uh, we've gotten much more organized. We finally have our 501c3 status. And all of this happened at the time of the pandemic. It's extraordinary. But uh, it's really been, we, we used the time well, and it, it afforded us to devote our entire souls to it. Uh, and uh, Gail, how are you? How are you doing, really? And I think you're down in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, I'm blessed by some lovely weather and a dip in the pool from time to time. But yeah, it's it's it, that that part is a blessing. But you know, to Cynthia's point, it's just extraordinary how this pandemic was a silver lining um, when it all started, and we'd always dreamt of. of of building a place for young women to stay in in the performing arts, but it was never, it was a pipe dream, never thought it could possibly happen. But the demographics of New York have changed. And with that, with the COVID the virus, um, there are a lot of opportunities now for performers to come to New York. And in our case, we're going to provide housing and mentorship and a flurry of, uh, of services for these young, performing, talented women. And, you know, today, Richard, it's so extraordinary that we're here today. Today, the inauguration and uh, and the message from Amanda. I don't know if you saw the message from Amanda Gorman, the poet laureate. Oh, I am in love with her. If anyone knows Amanda Gorman, get her here. I want her on this show. Well, I want her to come and live at the rehearsal club. So, and she, you know, she's a terrific example of the hope and the promise of this new era that we're going into. And uh, with the darkness that we hope to leave behind more every day with vaccinations, we are open, opening an institution of tremendous potential, uh, serving all sorts of women of diversity and need. And I, it's very extraordinary. And the response of our fundraising campaign, there's been a groundswell, Cynthia can tell you, of, uh, of donors that have just come, people we don't even know about, who said, we understand this mission, that women of today uh, need us more than ever, especially in the performing arts, when there's so little uh, opportunity, um, you know, at that, that intermediary level, this, we're going to really feel a huge need. So it's terribly exciting, Richard. 
I, I, I'm so thrilled about what you're doing. I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Rehearsal Club. Uh, I know that it opened in uh, 1913, uh, yeah. and then it uh, it opened originally on 46th Street, moved to 45th Street. See, I did my research, uh, and then uh, they um, it essentially shut down in 1979. Interestingly enough, that was the year that I moved to New York. Ooh. And Cynthia, if I'm not mistaken, I think that you stayed. Did you both stay at the rehearsal club? Oh, yes. Yes, Here. we're both Here's a Here. former resident. Yeah. So let's start with you, Cynthia. How did you discover the rehearsal club? And what are some of your earliest memories when you arrived there? Uh, they quite frankly saved my life. Uh, I know Carol Burnett says that in her quote. Mm -hmm. She lived there also when she was a young woman. Um, I literally arrived on in New York on the Greyhound bus with no job, no place to live, and twenty five bucks in my pocket. Now we from where? <laughs> yeah. Oh, where did you come from? I was I had been on tour for a year with the National Shakespeare Company, and I was okay. directly coming from North Carolina to New York. Now was that so, where you're from originally? No, I grew up in, well, uh, no, I grew up in uh, Detroit, Michigan and Newport News, Virginia, but I went to school at the North Carolina School of the Arts when it was just okay. born. Okay. Incredible. So I, uh, there was no internet, of course, in those days. Uh, the rehearsal club didn't advertise. We didn't have cell phones, but I had a girlfriend, a classmate who was living there. In fact, two classmates of mine were living there, so I knew about it. And um, I was just kind of planning to live on a sofa here, a sofa there. I did have friends that had already moved to New York, but I had no grand plan and no money. So I called my two girlfriends at the rehearsal club and they said, well, we're kind of full right now, but come meet the house mother. We'll see what we can do. And the house mother took pity on me and she put a cot in a room with two other girls for me. And I uh, had a room and two meals a day on West 53rd between 5th and 6th for about 60 bucks a week. Oh now, my God. Wow. I didn't even have the 60 bucks. Yeah, I didn't even have that money. So I gave them $10 toward my food. And the next morning I went out and got a New York Times for the want ads and backstage for the auditions. No agent, no union card, no nothing. And started in. And uh, that piece of the, being in the safe arena of the rehearsal club has made my entire 51 plus year career possible. If That's they amazing. hadn't taken me in, I wouldn't have lasted two weeks. Now, let me, uh, you know, and I want to hear your story too, Gail, but it's a thought that just dropped into my head. Was it specifically for actresses uh, in New York or were, uh, was it open to other young women as well? It was open to performers, performing arts, aspiring people who could have been actresses. Many of us were going to schools such as the American Academy of Dramatic Arts or the Neighborhood Playhouse, et cetera. And then a lot of women were dancers. A lot of Rockettes lived at the club. Mm -hmm. And it was a sanctuary. And Cynthia, you're a lot younger than I am. When I lived there, I paid, I paid, six, I paid $21 a week for two oh. meals and, and a, room, a lovely room with a fireplace. I had roommates and stuff, but you know, it was really, it was amazing. And it was kind of shabby. Actually, I have a little, I don't know if we can do this. this yeah, of course. Here. Okay. Uh, wrong go in the other direction, yes, that's great. Okay, and so a little background in the story, which is really pretty extraordinary. These two brownstones were owned by the Rockefeller family who was kind of donated them to the rehearsal club. They were two. Sure. Was it a dollar? Uh, a month? Yes, they, uh, exactly. Until, from 19, I think 20 or something, until 1979, when you arrived, Richard, and the city of New York was going bankrupt. That's and great. that's when the rehearsal club, uh, within six months, absolutely closed the doors and the women were literally on the steps with their suitcases. And there was a lot of publicity about that because there was no chance of meeting the tax uh, uh, situation on 53rd Street next to MoMA, of all places. Our location was great. And here's a little, this is another wonderful photograph from uh, the Museum of the City of New York. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see yeah. the girls, at, you know, hanging out. And so to make a long story short, uh, the cl the club closed, but my goodness, the alumni are still around. We're not spring chickens, but and but here we are. And in in two thousand and six, uh, the alums and I wasn't even involved at that stage, although I was lived there for two and a half years. I was living offshore. Got in very involved with Kathy Conry, our emeritus founder, and 
a tea party was formed around a production of Stage Door. And she called, she called some old alums and said, hey, can you get together and we'll discuss the treatment of our production. And that was the birth of the alum association, which has grown over the years. And there are a lot of talented women out there all who went to the rehearsal club, they may not have become stars, but they were all so successful because they were determined young women, smart, courageous, and with great spirit and values. And that was that was the, the hallmark of the institution. And that's what we're gonna do when we get our new group of young women. That We know that's gonna happen, that installation of values. The sisterhood of the rehearsal club is still in place after all these years. Some of us never even knew each other when we lived there, but we do now. Uh, it's just been an extraordinary thing. And producers came to know that if you were a rehearsal club woman, you had the stuff. Truly, truly. You know, there's something very special about that time when you first arrive in New York City. You're first uh, trying to get your feet uh, in the water. Um, Many of the people that I met in those years of struggle are still friends of mine to this day. And Absolutely. I'm sure that it's probably the same with both of you, with some of the women that you met uh, at the rehearsal club. I want to ask you, going back to the history a little bit, uh, the movie Stage Door came out in, was it 1936, I think it was? Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, even though it was called the Footlights Club in the movie, did Edna Ferber have any connection at all uh, with your uh, with the actual rehearsal club? Oh, do you want to see Cynthia? Do you want to speak to that? No, you go ahead. Okay, because I don't want to misspeak because I I, I want to get my facts right. But she never lived there per se, but apparently she disguised herself and got inside and learned all about the, what was going on inside. And then, and I don't know what name she went by. Uh, and then she came out and, and, and wrote the book, uh, the play, and then eventually it became the screenplay. Is that right, Cynthia? Is there more to that's, it than that? That's my, that's my understanding. Now, in my research, I discovered that uh, in addition to these rooms, because that's for me, uh, that's what I always knew about. But in addition to, there were rehearsal rooms, there were uh, congregation rooms where people were able to just be there. How was she able to infiltrate herself, for lack of a better word, uh, into the rehearsal club and do this without being a resident there? It's a fabulous question, and we have the we will get the answer for you because we have an historian who knows all of these details, and I'm not sure, but she there she did take she was able to do this disguise for quite a lengthy time. I mean, it's interesting also, Richard, that although we were all living there and many people sharing rooms and all that stuff, everybody was busy. Most people were trying to find you know fifty dollars a week to pay the rent, and then and then also going on auditions and trainings and education and so on. Uh, so there was a lot of coming and going, but there were the gentlemen were only allowed on the first floor. There was the gentlemen's parlor. No one could go up those stairs. I heard it happen, but when I, I was there for two and a half years, it never <laughs> happened when I was there. Not that I know of. Um, that happened, I guess. And so it was a really busy place with girls coming and going and all sorts of stuff, if that answers the question. Now, you in California, California, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Yeah, you could live there and not know everybody because you, your schedule Absolutely. is completely different. You're in rehearsal at night or your waiting tables in the day. You know, you, you could easily live in the same place and never even know each other. Right. And but was your rent, it was still in place. Was your rent based on how much you were making or was there a flat fee that you paid to be there? Flat fee. It was pretty much a flat fee, and they never talked about it. And I think they gave special consideration to some who maybe had less means or were really needy. And, and and like in Cynthia's case, she didn't have the rent to even begin with, and they just saw a really good person. You had to have referrals. You had to get a letter from your priest or something. And um, But it was very, you know, it was pretty broad for those days. Uh, and our new initiative, we certainly hope to go to diversify. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to have a lot of very different kind of women, different, different, and it's nationwide, of course. Our alums are spread all over the U.S. So we're reaching out to them now to bring us pockets of talent, to recommend people. And we have a residency program that is just beginning. And that's going to be our feeder into this fabulous institution that we're, we're going to be, our revival will take place. Now, Cynthia, you, when you first came there, you were on a cot. How long were you on the cot before you actually got a room there? 
Uh, I never did get a room there. Um, I only lived there. <laughs> yeah. wow. I lived there only for a few weeks, like you know, maybe a couple of months tops. Uh, I was lucky and got a job waiting tables in the village right away. And I, I had six other jobs, of course. And I'm just running around babysitting and you know, uh, cleaning apartments, whatever I could do to make a buck. You know, I could almost never get back to the rehearsal club for my two meals. It was really, yeah, really crazy. No, obviously, I mean, this has a special place in your heart. Uh, it opened those doors for you. But what is it about the rehearsal club that still resonates so strongly with who you are today? The support system that I encountered there. I mean, I did have two friends from college that were already living there, but I never saw them. We were all busy, you know. But um, like, for instance, uh, my first Broadway show was a little hit called Grease. And um, I had never prepared. I had no union card, but they had an open call. And one of my rehearsal club sisters played the piano in the parlor for me to prepare my audition, which I was sure I was not going to get. I was just going to see how they run a musical audition and ended up getting the job. So there are all hundreds and hundreds of those little stories where you learned your lines with one of the girls up in the room with the cot. You know, it, it, they're just go, they go on and on. It was that support system, which is still in place today. It is. And, you know, to, to that point, Cynthia, I love to mention that um, the, although we are all in the most competitive business in the world, you know, the performing arts for women, the, none of that competition really seeped into our sisterhood because we were all sort of trying to survive together. So it was really, we were all lifting each other up. And so that's one of the great takes that I have from those years of the values. And today those values still exist amongst each other. We support each other ad infinitum and you know we do whatever we can for each other and uh and that's never going to change i know and gail how long were you at the rehearsal club i was there for about two and two and a half years while i was training with the american academy and so on and so forth and i was working as well and so they were so sweet the little kitchen people if you couldn't make your meals they would uh, do a little brown bag lunch and i would carry that off to uh my job at the statler hilton answering telephones in in foreign accents and things like that <laughs> well, it's been a while since i read carol burnett's memoir but if i remember yeah. correctly she was busy auditioning she really wasn't getting um a lot of work so she decided that she was going to create her own show and she did this with many of the women who were at the rehearsal club. And then they put their own show on and they got the agents to come in and see them. And whatever happened to her? <laughs> I have no idea. But also during her time, she started, she was one of the magnets to starting these, these wardrobe sales. So in those days, they had a very fancy board of people like Margaret Truman and all sorts of people. And these fancy ladies of New York, these doyennes would uh, donate their wardrobes of fabulous designer costumes. And they would be either I think auctioned off or people would bid on them or they'd be just donated to the rehearsal club. So these girls had fabulous dresses to wear and the girls shared the dresses. I mean, you know, because if you had an audition and you needed a blue dress, you knew that blue dress was hanging in the closet. So people would borrow and, and circulate the clothing and stuff. So those were great days. Now we're hearing all these great stories and I'm, uh, go ahead, Cynthia, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, uh, there would be evening gowns. You know, who has an evening gown to wear to an opening you suddenly get invited to? We could go to that closet and borrow an evening gown. Right. Uh, and I'm all about celebrating, and I want to continue celebrating. But were there any uh, things about the rehearsal club that were not so rosy as you're both presenting it to us? Oh, it was shabby. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But we all we overlooked that because we were so grateful. Uh, but it was yeah. very, very shabby, kind of run down old black brownstone with squeaky stairs and doors that uh, oak doors that had these enormous uh, squeaks and uh, yeah, very shabby. And walk up, you know, it was a four story walk up and shared bathrooms. Uh, and everything was painted that sort of throw up green color, you know, from the fifties uh, when I, when I was there at least. So, but we we muddled along and had good times. 
There was one phone booth in the parlor with a cork board for messages because, you know, we had all live uh, human beings for answering services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could hear people, you know, the phone would ring, somebody walking by would pick it up or we would actually there was a, a, a roster of uh, phone duty so that somebody would always be manning the phone. You would take turns manning the phone and you'd holler up and say, hey, Christy, you got a call. She ain't here. Leave a message on the cork board. <laughs> right, so really. That's the way it was. It seems like this romantic, you know, experience to be a part of. And I mean, I'm sure you both of you have seen Stage Door. Uh, how much of what we see in the movie is very much like what it was like there? Very much oh. like what it was like. <laughs> but not so glamorous. But mm -hmm. there were hard times and there were good times. And yeah, it's it's not it's not ba bad. Uh, but as Cynthia said, so many of us were not there for most of the day that it was a little different with, you know, we didn't sit around the parlor like they do in stage door and, and have, have all those dramas. There were some dramas, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, it, you know, it was a little bit more working and educational and that sort of thing. But you, it, always, you both always felt that it was a safe haven for you to both be in. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, we were so naive. I was 19 when I first went there and I, I don't, Cynthia, how old were you? About I was something? 23. I had just You're turned 23. 23. Wow. Well, you know, uh, the girls I hung out with, we were really just trying to survive. We were so mm -hmm. naive. We didn't know what was going on. So it was just nice to have the support of all of them. And then, um, you know, and then once in a while, go out and do something glamorous, but not often, that's for sure. Now, like I said earlier, I came to New York in 1979. And for those of you who may not remember or were not around at that time, uh, it was very gritty. I thought I was coming to the world of breakfast at Tiffany's. And actually, <laughs> I was coming to the world of taxi driver and yeah. midnight cowboy. That was the New York that I came to in 1979. Yeah. Uh, approximately when in 1979 did the doors shut for the last time then, because we know they're reopening, uh, but when they shut down in 1979, when did this happen and what was the final uh, reasons for shutting down? It was the financial statement. It was June 30th and they were closing their books, so they closed the doors and said, bye girls. Literally, they, they were locked out. I mean, they had a, they had 30 days to get out. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apparently the writing was on the wall about the 1st of January 1st of 1979, and they were looking around for, for, for rescue, but there was no rescue. And the, the Rockefeller money had evaporated, and as we all know, that's continued, and now there's no funding for anything. So, um, so it was meant to be, but it was a really, those were dark days for New York, as you know, really. Absolutely. But when everything shut down, you said there was, I mean, there were efforts to try to save. Well, they, they spent six months trying to find bailouts, but they, there was, there was no money available to them. So they finally closed. It was very, it was terribly sad, but it, it was something that had to happen. Now, before we get to where we are now with the rehearsal club, I want to ask you both, how did the two of you meet? Oh, at the rehearsal club. <laughs> yeah. You're the alum. We were there at different decades, actually. Uh, but yeah, through our sisterhood, that you know, we're all a bunch of sisters and great sisters too. We met. Wow. We, met we met at an, at an alumni gathering maybe uh, seven years ago. Is that about right, yeah. Gail? Yeah. Right, Six, seven years ago. Right, yeah, but we didn't know. Now, did these alumni before. gatherings continue to happen even after they shut their doors in '79, or was this something that got a resurgence several years down the road? It had a resurgence several years down the road because of Kathy Conry. Yeah, but there were pockets of girls who always stayed in touch. And so, you know, if you right. lived in California, for instance, we have a nice contingency of girls in uh, California because they're all out there working. And so they all stuck together. And so they have a really nice network. And the New York girls kind of stuck together. But it's just unbelievable how many women are coming back, finding us through the Internet, through Facebook, through social media, and are coming back. Last year, I mean, we have about – small we have about 80 members right now we could have we know about 135 but every year we get a dozen or so that are women you know they're all they all live there 79 or 
earlier and they find us and they come back and they are full of stories and a life of a career related to the arts. If they didn't make it acting, they made it with a dancing school or something, uh, directing plays or whatever. And that's what's so fabulous about the women who came through those doors. You know, they were really serious, talented women. That's what we're going to do. Next. Well, I want to talk about the timeline to where you are now. Um, how did the seed get planted? Uh, who planted that seed uh, that we're going to revive the rehearsal club? Cynthia, that's your story, babe. This is a I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm guilty. <laughs> uh, it was, it, it, it was always my dream. Once, once the rehearsal club gathered together again, um, my dear friend Denise Pence Bookfar, uh, she who brought us Denise together. So Denise, yes. thank you. Yes, yes. thank you, Denise. She, after me for two years because the uh, the alumni were going to uh, write a book. They were going to collect uh, uh, 10 page memoirs from all the former residents of the rehearsal club and put them together and make a book that we could maybe use as a marketing tool to make another rehearsal club. That was kind of the big dream. Uh, so that's how I first got involved again with the, with doing the book, which we're still looking for a publisher, anybody if they're out there interested. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, it, it, it just so happened I got this wonderful, wonderful job with a bit of a profile, a high profile called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I had met uh, an investigative reporter at a cocktail party at a gala at the National Arts Club. And I was telling her about the rehearsal club and she was asking me a lot of questions. Well, investigative reporter, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she ended up doing a story on me in the New York Post talking about the rehearsal club. Well, the next thing I knew, I'm getting hundreds of messages from all over the country, from actors, from uh, uh, producers, from realtors, from uh, educators, <laughs> all saying, oh my gosh, we need this, we need this. How can we help? How can we help? Well, fast forward, Gail had uh, an extraordinary friend who stepped forward offering an anonymous donation of $100,000 that if we could match fundraising $100,000 $100, from June 1st, I mean, from December 1st, 19. Uh, 2020 to June 1st, 2021, that this person would match that dollar for dollar, dedicated to housing. Well, that really put us over the edge. Now, we had already gotten uh, become a, a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, I found an organization called the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, and they oh, held our I, all I, through I, that yes. process. They were yeah. amazing. They were amazing. And, and then they helped us get our nonprofit status, which just came through several months ago. So we are ready to go now. We're actively fundraising. And it's just been a, a, a preposterously fabulous journey. We're doing yeah. this. And we got connected with a place called the Webster Apartments in Hudson mm -hmm. Yards. Uh, they saw the article in the Post and they got in touch with me. I went to talk to them. They have this beautiful facility and now we have to make a long story short we have formed a partnership with them and we are taking a wing of apartments the rehearsal club at the webster apartments in hudson yards as soon as COVID allows us to move in that's amazing now there's a yeah. wonderful uh documentary called miracle on 42nd street i don't know if you've seen it about the history and the evolution of manhattan plaza uh and affordable housing in those buildings um how Will this be affordable to a young actress coming to New York wanting to get started? Obviously, the world has changed. It's a very different world. Uh, will the format of the new rehearsal club be very much like it was before? What will be the same? What will be different? Well, I can speak to that. The format will be more or less the same, uh, subsidized housing in a beautiful facility that is much more grand than our rehearsal club ever was. And uh, the building has uh, rehearsal rooms and we're going to have a rehearsal piano. And but what we're doing uh, differently because of this anonymous donor who's opened up a vision for us to for mentors. And so what we never had at the rehearsal club was mentoring. We, it was a boarding house and you went off and you tried to survive and found your way. So we're taking that whole concept one step far, forward and we're gonna offer immense support. Also, because we know that young women today really need it more than ever 
especially diversified women, if they come from a lack of means or whatever, they really need the help that we're willing to provide them. And now we have, this is being run now by this whole legion of alums who have vast experience around the nation. And those alums are going to bring the talent to these young women, where they're going to bring the experience and the wisdom to help these girls get a leg up on a serious career. So that's one of the most exciting aspects of all. And that's phase two that we're now getting into, which is really exciting. And so they will be subsidized. They won't pay zero. They're gonna pay a very, very reduced rent. They will have to compete to get in. I think we'll have an audition process of some type. I mean, we really will be looking initially for very talented girls uh, if they want the scholarship program. And certainly we will offer other services, mentorships and so on to girls who can pay the full rate, which is still very affordable by New York standards, but they'll receive uh, meals, security. Again, this is a facility, no gentlemen allowed, girls only. You can, there are little parlors downstairs. Yeah, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, well and, um, and, and the meals are divine. I mean, they have these lovely gourmet meals and, uh, and various activities. Of course, they're, uh, they're really handicapped at the moment from the pandemic, but um, they're, they're moving mountains to reopen. Everybody's hoping it's gonna happen soon. And we are too. We certainly right. hope in the fall. We'll be in there by the end of the year. We're just not sure what part of the fall we'll go in. Now you mentioned- we'll a have, um, Go ahead, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Said, we're planning to have workshops that uh, yeah. possibly other uh, theater artists could uh, to pay a fee and to attend uh, in addition to the mentorship. And uh, yeah, it's an incredibly safe, secure and working and, Yeah, we'll have social occasions and so on, especially for you know, young girls coming from out of town who know nothing, you know. So uh, it's the sky's the limit. And we're offering oh. false offers too of anybody who wants to help or mentor or fund or whatever. Back. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get we're gonna raise some money for you. Oh uh, yay. But, yes, but beyond the apartments, um, and you talk about these mentoring programs and everything. Will this be specifically for women or will men be able to partake in that as well? Well, our charter for our, you know, for our nonprofit status, really, uh, we are w based on women, although that can be changed in the future. But the facility that we're going into also is a residence for women only. So that's number one. And our and our charter, our mission statement, it really pertains to women. Although, hey, it's a whole new world out there and, and everything is changing. And we are open to all kinds of changes as we go forward. Now... Uh, you know, going back to, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, the scholarship. Um, what does that really entail and uh, how can one apply for the scholarship? Ah, uh -huh. Cynthia. You know, well, I am I am uh, chairman of the admissions committee, and we are just about to start planning all of that. Uh, most of us have the idea just as a boilerplate uh, to do it the way we did the rehearsal club in the first place, which was you had to audition to get in. You know, the standard uh, a contemporary and a classical monologue under five minutes. Um, two letters of uh, from theater professionals vouching for your seriousness. Those were the criteria that. That were in place for the original rehearsal club and i, well, you know, I want to go there for a moment because that's a thought that's running through my head right now what was the criteria for being able to stay uh, at the original rehearsal club that was it you had to audition to get in you did your monologues and you had to have two letters uh, for, uh, from theater professionals vouching for your seriousness and then the board of the rehearsal club at that time mm -hmm. would choose the candidates yeah, and also personal references. Uh, they really wanted to have young girls of character, really and truly, and, and they really did get them almost all the time. Mm -hmm. I never knew of really any duds or, or I mean, or they were eliminated quickly or something because, you know, there were, they were, we were all pretty similar, you know, in our intent. So it was great. It was very good what they did. So when you auditioned to stay at the rehearsal club, were you auditioning for theater professionals or was, I mean, who made those decisions? The people on the board of the rehearsal club were theater professionals themselves. So that was yeah. that. Yeah. 
And so, I actually, when I was so lucky when I moved in, I, they didn't make me audition. I did have two letters of recommendation because my uh, teachers said were, were already figures in the theater in the New York Broadway scene. So mm -hmm. I had people vouching for me and I had two girlfriends from college who were already living there. So and then I had just come off the tour with the National Shakespeare Company for a year. So they figured, ah, she's got the, you know, she's got the stuff. So they, they didn't make me audition. <laughs> There was one time when I when I first came to New York where I stayed, they used to call them SROs. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a bathroom down the hall. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a phone booth downstairs in the lobby. Um, so I know what that world was like. Um, it's a different world that we're living in right now. And obviously the two of you uh, are geniuses in terms of reaching out to a wider uh, group of people because of social media. Um, if you both can address what you're doing with social media in terms of getting the word out about what you're doing. Learning well, how to use it, mostly. <laughs> yeah, really. But, you know, this is another wonderful thing about this initiative. Uh, the world is our oyster in terms of resources through the Internet and so on. So we've been lucky enough to form an alliance with the Taproot Foundation. And we, they, we apply for certain areas that we're looking for help in. And one of them has been social media. And so they gave us, they awarded us, we threw, again, we had an audition uh, an application process. This young woman who for me has just hung the moon in terms of social media. She's a junior in college at, at uh, Chapel Hill and she is so talented and she knows all about the rehearsal club and all of us and she's spent numerous hours redoing our whole profile to get us up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Messenger, all of those. She says, you know, she believes that's the future. We all know it is. We just don't know how to do it. And she knows how to do it. So she's given us 50 hours a week. She's going to, uh, a month or something. She's going to, she's going to do a lot more for us and then teach us the ropes. So there's a lot available to us because of our history, our reputation, and now our 501-3C status. And we're, we're, un we're turning over every rock to get every bit of help we can. We have no employees after all of this. I mean, we have nothing except us, our sisterhood. It's just all volunteer, all volunteer yeah. from the yeah. sisterhood. That's amazing. And obviously the pandemic is slowing things down with you, uh, but have you started receiving applications already? Uh, We're not in a position to do that yet because we, can, we okay. can't offer when you can move in. Yeah. As soon as Early we know when we can move in, we can go to town. But yeah. what you are in a position for is accepting donations. Am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> so get there. I've got on the bottom of the screen here the website for the rehearsal club. Uh, but if people want to make a donation, is this the best way to do so? Or what do you suggest? I think so. I mean, okay, so the website is there. We are also on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of those things. But there is a donation page on the website that people can go to. They can also, if they need more information, we have lots of information. This is our, here are our two stars, Carol Burnett. Uh, Again, I wonder what happened to her. What happened to her? She got in her room and so did, and so did Blythe Danner, purchased her Danner. room. For so There's Blythe. We also have other stars who um, we're expecting to hear from, such as Diane Keaton and Kim Cattrall, uh, Sandy Duncan. I could go on and on. The Legion of Stars that went through that place is pretty amazing. So, yeah, so they can do it through the website. And if they'd like more information, uh, we have everything from a strategic plan, which took a year from our strategic planner to build, which is going to be extraordinary for grants and funding, as we know we've got to go down that road. We have to get some grants because we need – an income stream and that's we have terrific hopes and we've got fabulous donors but we have to create an in income stream and that's part of the next phase of also creating the residency program so we're, we're busy doing that well again obviously the pandemic stands in the way of a lot of things that you can do but what are in what are the plans uh, for when you are able to start opening your doors and everything as far as fundraisers are concerned and you know, and other ways of getting your message out to more people. Well, I do uh, want well, to speak to that. We have, I was going to talk about the plaque. What, yes. You know more about that than I do, Gail. You talk about those things. 
Well, okay, just in a nutshell, uh, before we the pandemic ever hit, uh, we had a lovely contribution from Blythe Stanner um, to help us find a landmark, uh, to, to fund some sort of a landmark on 53rd Street where we were originally located. Well, it took a long time to find out that we just couldn't put anything in the pavement, this, that, and the other, and it took probably six months to find the New York Public Library, who very generously said, yes, we respect your history, uh, Stage Door, which won the Pulitzer Prize. We will donate a plaque in your honor at the 53rd Street location, the branch right across from MoMA. And so we are we are we have a plaque ready to go and across the street MoMA has offered to help us if you know things have changed since the pandemic so I can't confirm exactly but mm -hmm. to have a reception for us out of respect because they're sitting on our DNA they dug us all up all those dead bodies extended MoMA all the way down 53rd street and so now what's left of us is under their Floors. So they have said yes, they would help us. And so we're waiting to do that. And then also the um, city of New York has great graciously, graciously offered us a, a proclamation. So we will combine the proclamation from the city of New York and it will be presented by Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough president and at the library, hopefully, as soon as we can open, I suspect the fall. And then we'll trot across the street, hopefully, and have a wonderful celebration hopefully at MoMA. I so hope. that's where we are. So we've got that, it's a nice little piece. And then we hope once we um, know more about our residency program and our start date at Webster, we'll have a ribbon cutting, we'll have all sorts of, of occasions. And then what we do every two years is called the Rising Star event. And that's where we have an audition program and we audition young candidates from emerging from theater schools and so on. And we do a wonderful, a bit of a gala, a competitive thing where we have a, a, a lineup of industrial panel judges from the, in, uh, the industry, some pe people like Simon Rubin, et cetera. And, um, and we award an award uh, to a young, talented woman. And it's you know, a nice piece of cachet for your resume. And so we're, that's waiting in the wings too, as soon as the city opens up. So that'll be, I think, at Symphony Space. We're not terrible, we're, we're reserved at Symphony Space if we want to use that theater. So we'll see. Now, so because, of course, you don't have the answers to my next question, uh, but uh, and you may not even be able to talk about this at this time, but do you have a rollout plan for how uh, you're going to start getting the word out uh, nationwide about what you're doing? Well, Cynthia, you can speak to that, I think. Well, uh, yes, our, our new media director will be helping us do all of that stuff. We're contacting all of the theater schools and conservatories across the nation. Really, my big dream, I see this being an international housing, uh, theatrical yeah. boarding house. I really do. I think there are a lot of people that want to come to the United States to work when we have it again. There's nothing mm -hmm. like Broadway. There never will be. It will be back. And we will be ready to support all those young women who want to and will be a part of it. And then again, to that, to Cynthia's point, the silver lining again of the, of the pandemic, the demographics have changed enorm enormously. New York is much less industrial, but New York is the capital of the performing arts of the world. And so these changes in New York are going to open incredible opportunities, I truly believe, for the performing arts. And I think it's going to be booming. It's going to take a while. But I think we are on the tipping edge of a whole new world of performance in the city. God bless New York City. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's not the ghost town that people think it is across the country. Uh, we are still thriving here. Uh, Gail, I want to ask you, are you still performing? Um, only with the rehearsal club. <laughs> uh, no, we're doing things like podcasts and stuff like that. Uh, we've done a lot, but I haven't done, since we retired to Florida, we haven't done much. My husband and I, my husband's also an actor and we do, we've done a couple of commercials and stuff like that. And he's done a lot of stand up, and uh, he's done the improvisation and club. And I, so, but so we're always out there. We're always ready and willing, but we're mm -hmm. more involved in grandchildren and the rehearsal club now. <laughs> Well, I want to ask both of you because I do have a lot of young artists that watch these shows and I do a lot of work for the Broadway Mentors Program. Uh, what advice do both of you give to someone? Again, it's a different world we're living in right now. Um, pandemic pushed aside. Uh, what advice do you give to a young actress or a young man coming to New York to pursue a career now? Do you have... 
Oh boy, it's a tough one. Yeah, but you know what? I just I I just have to believe that there are still thousands and thousands of young women out there who were just like I was. There's nothing else you want to do. There's nothing else you can do. It is a calling and you must come and you must take your bite out of the big apple and you figure it out. And the rehearsal club will be there in place with arms to hold you and you know the heart to support you. That's what we were in the first place and why it's lasted all these decades, even though we didn't have a physical boarding house. We will again, and we're gonna be even more helpful to the young people. So beautifully said, Cynthia, beautifully stated. And that it really is true. So although, you know, we're I would say to a young person, this wonderful statement by Carol Burnett that if you have a dream, you must go for it. You owe that to your life. Don't give up. Go for it. But you know, you've got to be a little have some smarts about it. And then but it's very, very tough in the performing arts where there's no transitional uh phase from your studies, your to the acting career. And it's very tough. It's really tough. So we're there to support those people. And that's our mission. And it's really a beautiful mission and so rewarding. I mean, really rewarding. So. And again, I want to ask each of you the same question again. Uh, but Cynthia, I'll start with you. Um, uh, you've been around uh, a while. I have two. Gail, you have two. And a lot has changed in this business since we all started. And obviously, we all started at different times. Uh, but Cynthia, what do you love most about the changes in our industry today? And what are some of the things that you find that you're still resisting at this point? Mm. Mm. Um, I'm having a lot of trouble with uh, the di this digital age because I just didn't grow up with computer language. Mm -hmm. uh, I never touched a computer until about 10 years ago. And I'm having a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> um, I'm still yeah. learning daily. Yeah. Ditto. Yes. I was almost not even here, you both know, because I couldn't even get onto this program. So that's, I really going to do some, I don't know, I got to do something. <laughs> Clean up my act. Yeah, and trying, again, trying to hang on to that digital thing, and uh, I, in many ways, the business is even harder than ever because mm -hmm. now casting is global; it is worldwide. You can get somebody from anywhere. It's the internet. It's like it's huge, and also creatively, there are a million more jobs. Jobs, creative new jobs available now because of the internet. I don't know how to do them, but you know, some of these young people coming up will have computer background and know how to work in the system. And and yeah, so it's 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 a whole new world, exactly. Now, Cynthia, you mentioned earlier that you got into the re uh, rehearsal club uh, because of the contacts you had. Gail, how did you end up at the rehearsal club? Oh my goodness. Well, my, I came from a family that was kind of involved in the theater. And um, just on a short note, my grandmother was the president of the rehearsal club oh, wonderful. for 12 years from the fifties until like 1967 or something. So I always knew about it. And she would take me there for lunches when I was nine years old. And she was born in Europe and France and came from a theater background. And in New York, she was married to a doctor and she became really more of a supporter of the arts, but she was a fabulous woman, a great supporter, a real ph philanthropist, and, and um, for 12 years, you know, she headed that ship, and that's the Carol Burnett days, and uh, who was gone by the time I got there, but um, they accomplished wonderful things um, before the city went bankrupt. So that's how I got there. So it was sort of a natural progression, and um, and I did have to have a le letter from the, the priest, the vicar, <laughs> but, but, uh, I, but I did get in. So um, that was how I got there. Well, in addition to the work that both of you are doing to preserve uh, the rehearsal club and move it into uh, the 21st century, uh, you both are also really involved in preserving the history. Uh, how are you getting a lot of the information? Is it word of mouth? Were there records that were kept? Uh, is it, how are you doing all of this? All of the above. Uh, yeah. Some people have photographs and, and things from the, when they were there. We've kept in touch. It's a word of mouth network. We're emailing each other. We have Zoom uh, pajama parties once a month where we get together and talk about mm -hmm. all those things. And Yeah, everything. And we have the memoir, which is full of uh, little vignettes from people's memories. We have that. And we have a trailer. Excuse me, is that available for purchase? 
Not yet. It hasn't been published. So we're looking for a publisher. I'm the publisher. And then, you know, uh, it, it's got some terrific material in it. So we think that that's a likelihood. Uh, the other thing is we have a fabulous trailer. Uh, we had a documentary that was kind of started and it sort of has stalled because without funding over the years. But now we're in a position to, I think, take that documentary further. Uh, but again, uh, our first initiative is the Webster Apartments and this residency program. But I think that's going to bring a lot out in the open because we are co we're getting continual inquiries about a doc are we doing a our documentary? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully that'll happen in the next three to five years because it's really a worthy thing. And uh, those years are gone. You know, the years of the New York blackout and that whole period in New York, when musical theater really was reigned king and queen, it was it was all people breathed, did, lived. It was the American musical theater, which we were very much part of. So. Now, again, as I said at the beginning of the program, it originally opened on 46th Street, moved to 45th Street, <laughs> went to 53rd Street, right. and now you've gone further downtown uh, with the Hudson Yards. Um, what are your thoughts, both of you, on that location? The landscape of New York obviously has changed a lot. Um, uh, again, uh, 1913, I don't know what 46th Street was like at that time, uh, but during the 70s and 80s, um, you didn't want to cross into that area. Uh, oh. It was such a different uh, area that you were living in. What are your thoughts about the new location? Well, the new rehearsal club is uh, at the Hudson, uh, the, the, the sorry, the Webster Apartments, as I said, that's on 34th and Dyer in the mid middle of Hudson Yards. Well, Hudson Yards uh, was having a huge big renaissance until COVID hit. Yes. Uh, right. So that area is changing drastically. Plus, the security at the Webster is very, very good. It's 24 hour and it's very safe neighborhood. It's also it's a, a populated neighborhood in Midtown these days. Uh, you can, because of its location, you can save a lot of money on the subway and the cab because you can walk mm -hmm. to most of the places you need yeah. to be for auditions, or you're going to be taping yourself in your room. <laughs> you know? Right. And the different. rooms, by the way, the rooms are lovely. They're fully furnished. The parlors, there are multiple parlors and various uh, sun rooms and reading rooms and a library. I mean, it's immensely large space created by Mr. Macy's brother, I mean, cousins. Um, and so, so there's, it's a huge space. It's going to be really fantastic for the girls. I have a little picture here if you want to see what it looks like. Oh, I'd like. love to. Can you see it? Whoa. There okay, it is. Screening room. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it has a beautiful rooftop terrace, lovely gardens in the back. I mean, I wish we could live there. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Uh, I want to ask you both um, with everything that we've covered today, uh, where do you, where would you like to see your vision? Uh, let's say five years from now. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <gasps> I would like to have several floors of apartments at the Webster, and I would like to have uh, it opened up to um, uh, international students. Um, uh, I just see it growing bigger and bigger. It's such a needed thing. It's uh, the support for the arts mm -hmm. is just so crucial. I mean, let's face it, folks, the arts are what completely got us through this pandemic. If we didn't have all this incredible content to be entertained by, we would have lost our minds. So we're needed and we know it and we're going to be here to provide what's needed. Absolutely right. And within that five years, then maybe uh, because we're so unknown, nobody knows who the rehearsal club is except for a few people on the interior of the theater. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice. We would, I'd love to see a documentary uh, to, for the leg to preserve the legacy of the theater. Cause there's a lot of great old footage out there and uh, there are a lot of stories. So hopefully within five years, that'll happen. There's been interest. There's just never been funding, but it's a great story. It's a great story. And well, 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 there are still so many of us around. Yeah. We need to do it soon because there are some of us who, who of the original residents who are still here to tell the story. So it would be amazing to get that done next. Yeah, and also, Richard, think about this. We could have a series, right? Like Netflix, Netflix series. Every every room in that building will have a different story, you know? And so, I mean, it could be a wonderful series. So who knows? Absolutely. Now, uh, present ladies excluded. Uh, I would assume that the most 
famous alumni uh, to come out of the rehearsal club is Carol Burnett. Um, who were some of the other uh, celebrities? You mentioned a few earlier, Blythe Danner, Sandy Duncan, uh, Diane Keaton. Uh, who were some of the other yeah. actresses who found this to be their haven when they first came to New York? Lots of them. Barbara Do you remember Anna, there? Or, uh, Anna Russell? Uh, Jane Meadows and her sister Jane and Audrey. Audrey Meadows was there. Um, oh, there are a lot. There, well, there's the Canteen Girl who was great. What was her name? Um, who has oh, been uh, a real Yeah. Sure? She died with a hundred years. I, I was watching, I saw that on the website. Uh, but uh, are you both, uh, with all the work that you're doing right now, are you on uh, Cal Burnett's radar? Uh, is she very much aware of all of the efforts that are going into place now? I, I, she you is. know, I think she is. And she's, you know, she's really quite elderly now. And she's really trying to uh, back off on, on 100. She's apparently chair of 147 charities or something. So she's trying to, do, you know, pull back a little bit on that. Uh, but she has always loved the rehearsal. Club. Oh, I know. Absolutely. And it, yeah. And so when you read her book, it really changed her life. And so, and, and that's those values that she came and inspired in all of us, those continue with her. And so she's always giving us her hugs and kisses and all this stuff. And we've given her an honorary award and we'll continue to, uh, to honor any of our alums that we can that, that support us. So she's been a fabulous support. Always, always mentioned. Her. So yeah. this is for you, Carol. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our show. Oh, my uh, God. I want to thank everybody for, that tuned in today. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, and if you don't mind, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Uh, sign the guest book with your thoughts about the show. Uh, that helps to boost uh, me and other markets. Uh, I also want to let everyone know, if you are around tomorrow afternoon, I am going to be sitting down and talking with Mary Sugarman, casting director of Tower Rubin Casting. This, of course, is on behalf of the Broadway Mentors Program. Um, look at the scroll at the bottom of the screen. I realize that everyone right now is going through difficult times. Uh, if you are able to make a contribution uh, for the future of the rehearsal club, by all means, do so. Um, I'm all about going out and doing something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. If you're able to do that, by all means, do so. And you never know, you may have a niece, uh, a cousin, uh, anyone who has dreams of coming to New York and pursuing a career like the three of us have been able to have. And they'll be able to come to New York and they will have a safe place. I love the ideas of the meals. And, oh, the yes. and the mentoring and everything that they're going to do. So please do that. Um, I want to thank Cynthia and Gail both for the work that you've done uh, and that you will continue to do. Um, I wish you a very successful season, Cynthia, on The Marvelous mm -hmm. Mrs. Basil mm -hmm. as you get back to work. Uh, may we all be back to work uh, yes. very, very soon. Gail, as you go into your next dip in the pool, yeah. think of me. <laughs> Now, Richard, and, it's an honor. Thank um, you. So I want to thank you both. But before we end the show, I want to give each of you uh, a final say. Um, anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to the world right now as we start on a brand new journey. God bless all of us. And God bless both of you. Cynthia, I'll start with you. Thank you so much for having us on, Richard. I've been watching your interviews for a while, and you're just just yeah. terrific. It's a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you for helping us get the word out. That's what we need most right now. I think that once the story gets out, that we will have more support. And I'm just so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Gail? And yes, Richard, I absolutely say thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just think that this is such an important day in all of our lives. I mean, I'm so honored to be on your program, but this of all days sort of triples the honor because it's such an important 
day in the future of our country and, and the world. And, and so I'm filled with optimism and hope. And, and I just hope that the, anyone watching this program and all that you do, Richard, for the performers that you work with is really extraordinary. And that deserves a, a wonderful bit of applause. And you know, it's all about love. Let's just pay the love forward, right? It's That's about paying it forward. And you know, I would be remiss if we did not thank your tech guy who got you on here tonight. Oh, you mean my husband. Your husband. <laughs> yeah, yay. Yes. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank now, you. go and watch the inaugural ce celebrations tonight. It's going to be fun. I love yeah. you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.